Sharon tolerated Roman's infidelities, perhaps in part because she felt inferior. Both were working professionals, but he was the star. One year later, in early 1969, Sharon Tate would find the purpose she had been searching for. She was a different girl. We were really thrilled for her. She was so happy. We talked about how far she had come, that she was much less passive, and that Sharon the mom might be a totally different person than Sharon the, the movie star or the mini movie star or the object, you know. And we'd had high hopes and we're going to see her after the baby was born and didn't make it. She loved babies and I'd had this, this new little granddaughter was only about maybe six months old. So Sharon had always asked Patty or Debbie, the younger sisters, oh, go up and see if you can ask Dorothy if she can have little Jill come down. I just, so she would. They'd take her down there and she'd keep that baby for an hour sometimes. Just, just love babies. In the spring of 1969, actress Sharon Tate discovered she was pregnant. Her husband, director Roman Polanski, had spent his childhood in the Nazi concentration camps and was opposed to bringing any children of his own into the world. And Sharon had told me she was pregnant before she told Roman even. She was, she was, afraid, she was afraid to tell Roman. Um, she was nervous to tell Roman. Sharon did not tell Roman until she was already four months pregnant. At first, he was furious, but warmed to the idea by the time she began to show. Sharon went house hunting for a place to raise her new baby. She told me she just was looking for something absolutely romantic and charming because it was a new marriage and she was very excited and she just wanted it to be romantic. And I knew of one house that was exactly what she wanted. She seemed very nervous about the marriage. She was like sort of an on, on edge and did tell me when she got pregnant and wanted me to help her with the baby's room that she was so excited to have a baby, not only for her, but because Rome would, would really look up to her as a mother. Sharon fell in love with the first house Elaine Young showed her, 10050 Cielo Drive. After moving in, she rushed off to France to squeeze in one last film, a French sex comedy, before her pregnancy would show. No! It's surely not by her that she'll find her. Oh, but it's so amusing to search. Sharon joined Roman in London for several weeks. Now eight months pregnant, she booked passage back to America on the Queen Elizabeth II. At the last minute, Roman stayed behind. Sharon left a copy of the Thomas Hardy novel Tess of the D'Urbervilles on his bedside table with a note suggesting it would make a good movie. He told me later that he had the strangest feeling he would never see her alive again. But he had a lot of those feelings, because his life was about things were great, and then they weren't. Sharon's family came to the Cielo Drive house to celebrate her return on the night of July 20th. <laughs> that was the last, last time I actually saw her. The whole family watched the moon landing all in Sharon's bedroom, piled up on the bed and around the, the foot of the bed, watching the moon landing, the moon walk. The night of August 9th, Jay Sebring took Sharon to dinner, along with two friends of Romans who were staying at the house, aspiring Polish filmmaker Wojtek Frykowski and his girlfriend, Abigail Folger, of the Folger's Coffee family. Sharon's sister, Deborah, was planning to stay that weekend, but called to ask if she could bring friends along. She said, ah, oh, Pumpkin, I just, you know, I don't feel like putting any makeup on. I really don't feel like getting dressed. I, you know, I, it was not a great, um, it was very, very hot. It was during a heat spell. And being as pregnant as she was, I understood that she was probably just miserable. So we kiboshed that plan out of, out of respect. I guess 
I wasn't supposed to be there, but I sure wish I was. One more wild thing might have made a difference, you know. On the morning of August 10th, housekeeper Winifred Chapman arrived to clean the home and discovered the slaughtered bodies of Jay Sebring, Wojtek Krakowski, Abigail Folger, and Sharon Tate. In a car parked outside the home was the body of Stephen Parent, who had stopped by to visit the groundskeeper who lived in a guest house on the property. I was in London and um, uh, my agent called me. He called me around 8 o'clock London time and told me that something happened in the house. I didn't know, I didn't know at first what house he was talking about. He said, it's your house. And then he told me that they were all dead. He expressed his you know, shock and, and, and he wanted to know from me that, that I would tell him that, you know, that I was sure that she knew that he loved her very much and so on. And I reassured him it was obvious that she knew that it was, uh, you know, it's not an open question there. Uh, the next day, Leno and Rosemary LaBianca were found dead in their Los Feliz home, killed in a similar ritualistic fashion. We're getting now down to the, the good old-fashioned type of uh, police work in that uh, you can't rely on, on computers or IBM runs or anything of this nature. You have to get out there and walk the streets and the investigators are checking out every possible lead. They're checking with uh, uh, known friends and associates and uh, checking with those people who else was known. I was realizing in the case of this nature where you have uh, so many people who are dead and then you try to find out, well, who did they know? Well, where do you start? Everybody was in complete shock. Com to, it's impossible to describe what it was, was like. I mean, it changed the town. The whole bunch of people who were all friendly around him and a group of people who I used to hang out with. It just changed everything. It just no longer was... Things were... People were frightened. And it became ominous and, and uh, nobody had a clue where this... Might, yeah, might be coming from. The police certainly didn't seem to know anything. Author Joan Didion wrote of this period, many people I know in Los Angeles believe the 60s ended abruptly on August 9th, 1969, ended at the exact moment when word of the murders on Cielo Drive traveled like brush fire through the community. And in a sense, this is true. The tension broke that day the promise was fulfilled. And since there were no culprits uh, available, and since the murder itself was so hideous and horrendous, uh, they uh, thought, they instinctively felt that the best way is to blame <clears throat> the victims for their own death. <laughs> 